I vote because my voice matters. I vote because my voice matters. I vote. I vote. I vote. I vote because America matters. Because my opinion matters. Because freedom matters. I vote because I matter. I vote because my future matters. I vote because my generation matters. I vote. I vote because who we elect to Congress matters. I vote because the midterm matters. I vote because the midterm matters. I vote because the midterm matters. Live from Mitchell Hall at the University of Delaware, this is Delaware Debates. Good evening. On behalf of Delaware Public Media and the University of Delaware's Center for Political Communication, welcome to Delaware Debates 2018. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Delaware Debates is also supported by the American Cancer Society's Cancer Action Network and the University of Delaware. This debate features candidates in the race for one of Delaware's seats in the United States Senate. The Democratic Party's nominee is incumbent Senator Tom Carper. Running as the Republican candidate for Senate is Robert Arlett, an incumbent county council member in Sussex County, Delaware. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. We're conducting tonight's debate as a conversation, and both candidates have agreed to rules for the occasion. There will be no opening statements. I'll begin with a question for both candidates, and they have agreed to hold themselves to 90-second answers. We'll also include in this debate questions recorded by students at Delaware State University and the University of Delaware. Now, although we're not having opening statements, we will welcome a formal closing statement from each candidate. The candidates on stage have also agreed to participate in this debate with some rules for the live audience here at the University of Delaware campus. Audience members have entered Mitchell Hall, understanding that this is not a pep rally. There will be no cheering or applause. This debate is about the candidates, not about the audience. I'll keep my questions short, and I'll ask the candidates to answer concisely so we can cover a lot more ground tonight. The candidates will answer in the order they determined backstage with a pre-debate coin toss. So the first question goes now to Senator Carper. It goes to both candidates, but I'll ask Senator Carper to answer first. Do you see the 2018 midterm elections as a referendum on President Donald Trump? I suppose in, in part it is uh, a referendum, but um, I think as much as anything, it's an answer to a question, do we believe in checks and balances in this country? The uh, Constitution, the framers of our Constitution put together this intricate system of checks and balances, executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch, uh, with the, uh, the idea that we would not end up with any one person being king. And they disagreed on a lot of things. Should there be one or two uh, units within the legislative branch? Who's going to appoint the judges? Would they be lifetime terms, roles of women, rights of women, slaves? But uh, I think the, the, the sort of the key ingredient for why our country's, country's uh, survived and, and been successful for all these years is checks and balances. And I think as much as anything, when people vote this year, they're going to be voting on checks and balances because they know they're likely to have this president for a while longer. And the question is, do they want to have someone who's able, and as I am, to work with uh, Republicans and with Democrats, but also to try to make sure that this, uh, this president doesn't end up paying royalty or a king with almost uh, endless powers. Mr. Arlett, is it a referendum on Donald Trump? I, I think it's a referendum of the voice of the American people. And specifically, I think in our race, it's a referendum, I think, on Senator Carper's career uh, as a public official, uh, a 42-year uh, career politician, 18 years in the U.S. Senate. And, and I think, ultimately, that's what Delawareans are seeking. They want change. I think that's what this election is about. President Trump won with a significant amount of success just two years ago. And the American people wanted change in America. That's what's great about this, this representative republic that we have. The voice of the people is what matters. He has gone to work. He is not a career politician. He is focused on results. He's actually a president who says what he means and does what he, and, and, and does what he means and, and means what he does. I think that's critical that we have elected officials who are focused re on results and not the partisanship and the party politics that exists in Washington, D.C. So we are very excited about this election cycle because I'm hearing change everywhere we go in the great state of Delaware. People want change, they want their voice heard, and that's what's most important about this very election and why we're running today. 
All right, I'd like to ask you a question that for one of you is a hypothetical, for the other it isn't, but I'd like you both to respond. I want to ask you both, how did you vote or would you have voted on the nomination of Judge uh, Brett Kavanaugh to be a Justice of the Supreme Court? Uh, Senator Carper? Well, I voted both ways. I voted for him. And the reason why I voted for him 12 years ago is he was pretty much a blank slate. We, uh, I knew a number of people for whom he had worked, with whom he had worked, uh, including some of our most uh, cherished and respected uh, judges uh, in this state. If I had known 12 years ago how he would turn out as a, uh, as a judge, I would not have voted for him. I've been very disappointed. He has perhaps the worst record on environmental issues of any judge that, that I know of. And 90% of the cases where there was an environmental issue for, for the environment or against the environment, 90% of the time, he voted the wrong way. He believes it's okay for upwind states, think Pennsylvania, think West Virginia, think Ohio. It's all right for them to spew filth up into the air and it blows down on downwind states. And we have no recourse to that. He doesn't believe that the, uh, this country should have the authority to regulate carbon dioxide, which leads to climate change, climate warming, extreme weather. He thinks that's all right. He doesn't believe the EPA should have the right to regulate uh, mercury or, or methane. Uh, and the, the list goes on and on and on. In fact, in 90% of the cases where there's an environmental issue at, uh, at stake, 90% of the cases, he chose the wrong side rather than the right side. That's why I voted against him. And, and you voted against him yeah. most recently. Okay, Mr. Arlette, how about you? How would you have voted? Well, I certainly would have voted yes. And, and I think uh, Senator Carper is, is a little off track slightly because he had already made his decision before the hearings. You had stated publicly that you were already against whoever really that nominee was. Your decision was all against the president of America. No matter who the nominee was, you were gonna vote against him. And I think that's why it's broken in Washington, D.C. That's why people are upset, because this partisanship, let's, let's respect the process. That poor man and his family went under tremendous amount of, uh, of discourse, and it was, it was appalling for America, and it was appalling as Delawareans to see that happen. I have to tell you, it was unbelievable what happened and what occurred, and it was uh, shameful of the Democratic Party, I say that, because they held on to that letter for weeks, and, uh, and, and she wanted to be held anonymous. That's a fact now. They brought it out for political gain at the very last moment, at the very last moment, excuse me. So to me, it was a political games game to the Democrats, and, and I was focused uh, on only on the facts of the hearing, and I would have voted yes. And since we're in the hypothetical range with you, uh, how would you have voted two years ago when you spoke about respecting the process when the Democratic president nominated a justice to the Supreme Court? I would have, I would have wanted the hearing. Okay. I, wa I would have wanted the vote. I think the Republicans were wrong. Again, respect the process. And, uh, and again, we're not a party guy, we're a principled guy. So two years ago, I have already on record, I'll say it here publicly, the Republicans should have allowed that up and down vote, and they did not. I think that was a mistake. All right, going to move on to a I'm question. I'm Tom Carper, and I approve this message. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to a, a question from a student. This is a senior political science and technology double major here at the University of Delaware you uh, with a question for both of you. With growing concern about partisanship on the judiciary, what could be done to alleviate that worry? Partisanship on the judiciary. Mr. Arlett, you I answer guess at first. all levels, I'm going to assume, perhaps. But, but the judiciary is not to be a legislative arm of the government. They don't make laws. And, and I think the partisanship is, is, uh, is unfortunate. That's why it's important that we have Senate candidates who understand the Constitution and will nominate uh, those who will apply the Constitution as written. That's what's most important. When you apply that litmus test, it, the politics are stayed out of it. It's all about interpreting the, the Constitution as written, very simple, and, and I think that's what needs to be done. Senator Carper? Yeah. The, uh, when the founding fathers were meeting up the road uh, all those years ago working on the Constitution, 231 years ago, they uh, grappled with a lot of issues. I mentioned earlier, rights of women, slaves, how many branches of government, uh, by, by, would there be a one or two, a unicameral or bicameral legislature? Um, age, you have to have lived in this country, born in this country to be president, ages and so forth. The toughest issue that they had debated, uh, uh, Ralph, was uh, judges. Should they have them? Should they serve lifetime terms? Who would appoint them? And they battled on that for weeks, weeks. And finally, voted up and down on the idea that the president would appoint with the advice and consent of the Senate 
and it was defeated. They went back to the drawing board, prayed some more, and they voted on again. Same compromise. The president will nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate. Voted on it, they approved it. That's 231 years ago. For all these years, we've been trying to figure out what does advice and consent mean? And I think uh, what, maybe what we need to do is take a look at a state like Delaware. I was a governor here for eight years. For every Republican I nominated to be a judge, I had to nominate a Republican. For every Democrat, I had to nominate a Republican. We had an equal balance across the, 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 the spectrum. And uh, we have one of the most respected uh, judiciaries in the country. And they, did not, they do not serve lifetime terms. They serve 12-year terms. And I think maybe uh, what we should do is find out what works and do more of that. And I would suggest that we take a long, hard look at the way we do business here in Delaware. And we may have something here that could be a model for the country. Now, both of you have talked about the advise and consent requirements. So I want to follow up on that and just ask you both uh, whether you think the Senate ought to be required to advise and consent on presidential judge nominations dur during the legislative session in which those nominations are made, uh, regardless of the national election calendar. Mr. Arlett first. I, I think uh, I would be open to the idea. I think, again, mm -hmm. I think that what, uh, what we have to do is, is have the transparency with the process. And, and the, back horn, the back door conversations, the back door deals, the games, if you would, I think America is fed up with the politics of Washington, D.C. So if it allows for the process to be more transparent uh, so the public can understand the process and be more involved in the process, uh, I, I would be supportive of that. So I would be open to that idea. Uh, Senator Carper, should the Senate be required to, to act? Yeah, I, I have no aspirations to be president, but I was governor. And, uh, one of the, if I were president, what I would want to do is reach out, especially to the republics on the Judiciary Committee, and say, these are a couple of people that I'm thinking about. What do you think? I would. And say, uh, I wouldn't give them veto authority, but I'd say, I'm thinking about this person, this person, that person. What do you think? And, and ask for their, uh, their, uh, their, their response. Barack Obama essentially did that. And he asked, among other people, Orrin Hatch, what do you think about uh, Merrick Garland? And he asked several other Republicans on the Judiciary Committee who had lavish praise and voted for Merrick Garland uh, years before to make him the chief judge of the, uh, the strongest or highest uh, district uh, court of appeals in the country. And they all said they thought he was great. They thought he was terrific. That's why, a big reason why Brock nominated him. And then for the most part, they wouldn't meet with him. They certainly didn't give him a hearing. I thought the way he was treated was shameful. And uh, my hope is that we don't have to remit, uh, relive that, uh, that chapter in the history of our country. All right, a student from Delaware State University is going to move us in a different direction now. She's a senior political science major at DSU. Let's listen. Due to multiple mass shootings in the country, do you think gun restrictions are needed? And how do you plan on addressing what seems to be an epidemic of mass shootings? topic is mass shootings and, and whether gun restrictions are needed. Mr. Arlett, first. You know, I think that uh, it is horrific and I'll be very clear, anybody who does, another, does harm to another human being, I believe is mentally ill. Let's just be clear. I don't care what gun or what type of gun that you're using. It is a person who is doing harm to another person, whether it be a gun, be it using a vehicle, being used at a knife. When somebody intentionally does harm to somebody else, you have a mental issue there, in my opinion. So to me, again, we are a, we are a constitutional republic in this country. We do have the Second Amendment. So I think that is the guiding light with respect to any uh, gun reg regulations or rules. I, so to me, uh, again, it's not necessarily the gun, it's the person. And I think we do have rules that we have to enforce that are not necessarily being enforced today. Again, I don't think we need more. I think we have to enforce what we have today. And I think we also have to uh, take a focus on mental care in this nation and stop playing around with that game because we all know the epidemic uh, uh, of the opioids and other issues. There's a lot of mental illness that we have in our nation. So I think we need to go down that path as well. Senator Carper, gun restrictions? Um, I just happen to have a copy of the Constitution here. And I'm looking at uh, Amendment 2. And I'll just read, briefly read it. It says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Doesn't say anything about uh, assault weapons. It doesn't say anything about bomb stops. It doesn't say anything about armor piercing bullets. It doesn't say anything about uh, uh, background checks. It doesn't say anything about those things. But, but my dad, I'm, I come from a, a family of hunters, fishermen. The only thing that Carper family is famous for in uh, West Virginia was the Carper rifle. One of the first things I bought with a little, as a little boy with my money for my paper route was a BB gun. One of my treasured uh, um, holdings is my grandfather's shotgun. My dad was, he bought buy and sell uh, weapons. And, uh, but, but you know, he, he was a guy who believed in common sense. He believed that uh, 
people who was trying to buy weapons should go through a, a background check. He believed that uh, armor-piercing bullets uh, were not for killing you know, birds and, and animals and, and so forth, and they shouldn't be used because he killed people. He believed that they're, they're, uh, he believed that if, if you're on a no-fly list, you shouldn't be able to buy weapons. And we ought to be able to, uh, to, to just to better ensure that we know who's buying these weapons. That's, those are common sense. Those are common sense ideas. And I think uh, when we vote in the Congress, we should vote and use some common sense while, while still preserving and-, and for, Senator, uh, no props allowed in oh, the debate. I'm sorry. Please put that. You Not quoted even the from it, so we're, All right, thank all right. you. All right. May I have one comment, Go if ahead. I may? And, and I would like to remind the Senator that assault weapons are already against the law, and so are arming, piercing bullets. Those are military issues, and again, it gets back down, back down to my point of enforcing the current laws. So let me ask you the follow-up, the obvious follow-up to this. Would you support repeal of the Second Amendment, Mr. Absolutely Arlette? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is America. Abso it is we, the people, to defend ourselves against the government. Absolutely not. Does this is America mean no amendments would ever be repealed or I didn't say or? that. But well, you, you, you referenced to the Second Amendment. Right, okay. So I'm listening so, very well, Ralph. Gotcha. Yes, sir. All right. Senator yes, Sharper, Second Amendment, should it be repealed? No, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be repealed. I think we ought to use some common sense in the way we interpret it. And, uh, and uh, uh, today, the, uh, we, we get to, uh, to vote. It's funny, Rob says there's a, there's perfectly, uh, it's already illegal to have assault weapons. I'm co-sponsor of a bill that actually outlaws assault weapons. And I'm not sure why we'd be offering that legislation if they're already outlawed. Won't be the I, don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think they, uh, they are outlawed. I, yeah. I think, and I think there needs to be a provision. I think we need to close the, make sure that background checks are, are, are put in place when people try to buy weapons, whether they're buying in a gun show or over the, the internet. I think the idea of bump stocks, the idea of these, having these uh, uh, ability to turn a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon, that's the kind of stuff we ought to stop. And okay. I think most people agree with that. All right, I'm gonna ask you each uh, another one of those questions that's hypothetical for one of you. Uh, I'm gonna ask how did you vote or how would you have voted on the federal tax overhaul of December 2017 and why did you vote that way? Senator Carper first. Yeah, I was governor for, uh, for eight years of this, uh, this state. We uh, balanced our budget eight years in a row. We cut taxes seven out of eight years, but we always balanced the budget. And the uh, tax cuts that we had largely benefited uh, middle uh, middle-income people. We uh, enhanced the economic growth rather than diminished it. And we always balance the budget. We always balance the budget. And when I consider uh, tax proposals as a member of the Finance Committee, I always consider those four issues. I always consider those four issues. This uh, tax cut that was signed into law entirely with Republican votes, sadly with no Democratic votes. And we could have had a bipartisan compromise too. But uh, it was not fair. I think something like 80 or 90% of the benefit goes to like 10, fewer than 10% of the people. The, uh, econo as the, the economy has been enhanced. What we have, we have a president who was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple. He, came, he became president at eight years into the longest running economic expansion in the history of the country. We passed this tax bill, throws all kinds of money into the hands of rich people. Most of that money is being used for stock buybacks. It pushes up the, uh, the stock market and it, can, it continues to make it look like we're being prosperous. But I will tell you, when you look down deep in, inside the tax cuts that were passed, in terms of their ability to foster economic growth, R&D, infrastructure, manufacturing, it's not there. Senator, you're out of time on that one. Mr. Arlett, would, how would you have voted on the tax bill I, in 2017? Uh, I would have absolutely voted yes because the focus is not the Washington swamp, the focus is Delawareans, and Delaware families needed the money, and they desired the money, and it helped their, their dollars. As a matter of fact, I recall when the Democratic leader said, I can't remember what the number was, $1,000, it was chump change. It was a comment, I think from Nancy Pelosi, if I'm not mistaken. Well, that's why she's out of touch to the American people. That's the problem with Washington, D.C. They make decisions not through the lens of the American people, but through the lens uh, that they live in, and that is called a bubble. That's the problem with Washington, D.C. And Senator, for God's sake, I tell you, the President of the United States, we've got the best economy. It is growing at a faster rate today than all of Barack Obama. So for, for you to make the statement that he was, uh, thinks he made a triple and he's standing on third, well, if that's the case, I think he's right. Because this economy is growing at, an, in a, at a tremendous rate, much more so than previously. And I think it's because of the decisions and the policies that he has set forth. And again, 
It's putting people back in their pockets because ultimately, let us not forget, it's not Washington's money, it's the American people's money. They know what's best for their dollars. I would encourage more tax cuts in the future if we have the ability to do so, I would encourage it. They know best and Washington is horrible at spending American tax. Follow up, follow up for a little discussion on this topic. It is widely predicted that this tax bill, and this is across partisan lines, that the tax uh, law that was in, enacted will raise the national debt by about a trillion dollars. Do you see that as a problem? If so, why? If not, why not? And if it is a problem, how would you address it? Senator Carper? The, uh, the nation's debt last year, about $550 billion. We just learned that the, 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 the debt this year, the year that just ended, is about $750 billion. The forecast for the debt next year is about $950 billion. The, uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden became president and vice president of this country, the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. They started at the very bottom. Banks were closed, people couldn't get loans. It was a terrible time, terrible time. And what they had to do was to fight without the help, frankly, the Republicans in the House of Representatives and the Senate to help lift us out of that for the next eight years. We, they turned over to this administration the longest running expansion in the history of this country. We passed this tax cut bill, which is like a sugar high for the stock market. And the money's being used to buy back stock, pushes up the value of the stocks, which inures mostly to wealthy people. Mr. Arlett, how about you, the question of the national debt being raised as a result of the well, passage I, of this uh, act? We have a, a major issue in this, in this country with regard to $22 trillion debt deficit as it stands. And so I understand what he's doing. He's you know, trying to uh, energize the economy and give the money back to the American people, whereas they will turn around and spend it. So again, I am concerned with the deficit, as all Americans should be, the government has got to focus on being better with the tax dollars. They have to learn how to be more efficient, more effective, and learn to do more with less, just like the regular Americans. And to your point, uh, Senator, you know, as far as it helped to the stock market and help the wealthy, well, that's you. Uh, I mean, the reality is that's not the average necessary Americans, but the reality is that's most of those in Washington, D.C. that are making these various decisions. And, and again, I think the focus has got to be on the American people and how to empower them so they can move forward and prosper and that's what my desire is. All right, I want to turn to uh, health care, which is a, obviously another major national issue. I'd like to ask whether either of you or both of you think Congress should take action to stop the administrative cuts to the affordable care law that's now, that are now being implemented by the Trump administration. So uh, should there be some congressional action at this point? Mr. Arlette first. Well, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act uh, is not affordable. Uh, you know, it, it is, it is absolutely irresponsible of Congress um, and, and really ultimately the Democrats uh, you know, who, who had to um, um, uh, approve of the bill so they could read the bill, if we all recall that. And just 10 years ago, the average um, insurance premium was just over $300. Today it's over $1,300, over $1,300. People's incomes have not quadrupled in 10 years. It is unsustainable for most families. That is the number one issue, I believe, in, in not only in America, but I believe right here in Delaware. And again, I will ensure that we repeal the ACA because it does not work. A big problem also with regard to the healthcare is the pharmaceutical drug industry. Politics has gotten too much into it. On day one, I will, I will offer a bill that will repeal the, um, um, the, the bill that allows the legalized kickbacks uh, from the pharmaceutical companies. And again, my opponent here has received over $550,000 from Big Pharma at the cost and the expense of the American people and Delaware families. Delaware families are starving to be able to, to afford their pharmaceutical drugs, yet they are out of control of the expense. Okay. And it's Congress's fault for, for this. Okay, Senator Carper, I want you to ask the question about the administrative cuts and congressional action, but because of a direct attack, you get an opportunity to respond to that. So should Congress take action to prevent the, to stop the administrative cuts to the Affordable Care Act that are being currently uh, implemented by yeah. the Trump administration. I'm gonna ask everyone to use their imagination. Imagine a pie, a pie chart. Inside a pie chart is 300 million people. Half the people in that pie chart get their health care from large employer uh, group health plans. About uh, 20 to 25% in the pie chart get their health care from Medicaid. Another 15 to 20% get their health care from Medicare. And the rest down here either get their uh, health care through, uh, uh, through an exchange 
or they pay for it themselves largely, or they don't get healthcare at all. The debate here has always been not so much on large employer healthcare, not on Medicare, not on Medicaid, but what do we do about this five or 10% down here at the bottom? We use an idea that actually was introduced in the, by Republicans in 1993. 1993 was taken by a guy named um, Mitt Romney, and he installed it as Romney Care in Massachusetts in 2006. And it had five principles. One, every state would have a, uh, um, a, uh, uh, um, gosh, exchange. Every state would have an exchange where they could go for people without health care could get the coverage. Every state not on the exchange, you'd have to, uh, everybody would have to get coverage. There would be a sliding scale tax credit to basically say poor people get more help in affording their, uh, their coverage. There would be an employer mandate and you couldn't uh, deny people coverage for re pre-existing conditions. What the Republicans want to do is attack and kill their own baby. Because what we did with the Affordable Care Act is we took Mitt Romney's idea and made it the exchanges and part of the ACA. And we should let it actually find out if it works. It worked in Massachusetts. It would work for our country. And the, this administration, because it's named Obamacare, this president, because of his enmity toward Barack Obama, wants to make sure it fails. Senator, do you want to say anything briefly about the direct reference to the $150,000 from $550,000. $550, That's a big difference. We have, we have a real problem in this country, and the problem is not those of us who receive uh, uh, contributions that are fully disclosed, fully disclosed, mm -hmm. for, forever, fully disclosed. People have any questions about monies that I received or Robert let, they will understand and see where the money comes from, except for the fact that dark money, where we don't have any idea where it comes from, can seep into campaigns. We don't know who donated the money. We don't know how it's been spending. And it, it makes minuscule the money that we raise on our own. What I think is, is the better thing to do is change the Constitution, frankly, to say that uh, Citizens United is going to be basically thrown out. We're going to, corporations are not people. They shouldn't be able to give enormous amounts of money to campaigns. And we should know where every dime comes from and for whom, by whom it's being spent. Okay. Uh, one, one more follow-up on health care. I want to ask both of you for a brief answer on this, please. Would you favor health care for all, a plan of health care for all in the United States? Mr. Arlett. Absolutely not. I think the government should get out of the health care business. I've had two health care town halls in the state of Delaware because I don't have all the answers. I listen to the professionals, those that are in the field, right, the professionals and the doctors and the patients. They know what's best. They live it each and every single day. They have said the government needs to get out of the health care business. Let's get it back in the private sector. Let's get more competition. Let's get it across state lines. And it does not work. We don't need to keep going because when you go from $300 to, to over $1,300, I think everybody that's here that's listening and watching at home, it doesn't work. So I would suggest we get the government out of the health care business, get it back to where it belongs in the private sector. All right, Senator Carper. There's a committee in the Senate called the HELP Committee, Health, Education, Labor, Pension Committee. And uh, they spent, uh, I'm not on the committee, but I joined them in spending a lot of time about a year ago to figure out what we needed to do to do, uh, stabilize the exchanges in all 50 states and to bring down the cost of health uh, uh, care coverage in the exchanges. They brought in governors, insurance commissioners, doctors, all kinds of people who had a view on this. And they came up with a consensus. There are three things that we needed to do. Three things that we needed to do. Agreement among Democrats and Republicans. If we do those things, we reduce the cost of insurance in the exchanges and outside the exchanges by 30 to 35 percent. The Republican, God, God bless him, the Republicans in the, the Senate would not allow us to do that. If we had done those three things, we would have, brought, we would have stabilized the exchanges, we would have had more competition, more insurance companies, and we would, frankly, uh, drop the cost by about a third. Just as a point of interest to both of you, the Center for Political Communication here at the university has just released a public opinion poll in Delaware that shows that 64% of Delawareans favor a health care for all plan. But let's focus on some civil rights issues now. I want to ask you whether you support laws or regulations that protect LGBT students in schools. Question is about laws or regulations protecting LGBT students in schools. Senator Carper first, please. I do, thank you. Mr. Arlett. I would say that we probably already do. It's called the US Constitution. There's already rules and regulations involved. If somebody does something to, to somebody else, there's already something in place to do that. I think, again, I think let's enforce the laws that already exist. One should not matter if they're gay or not, or, or black or white or Asian like my wife is. In my mind, we are all creatures of God. We are truly all miracles. And I think that Constitution protects 
all Americans as written. The question is, are we enforcing? That's the question, are we enforcing? In the primary election, you raised the issue with your primary opponent, who's obviously not running anymore. Uh, did that, is that, does that fit with what you just said about we're all Americans? And sure. It does? Sure. Okay. All right. I, I, I will share with and you. I mean, uh, with regard to the, to, to the gays, my father-in-law was gay. I own a real estate business uh, downstate, uh, and I have a realtor who works for me who is gay. None of that doesn't, I see, I don't see that. What I see are creatures of God, and I believe we, we are all very, uh, all created in the image of him, and we're all very unique and very special. All right, and Senator, you were governor once, as you've mentioned, of the state of Delaware. The current governor withdrew such regulations protecting LGBT students in school after they received uh, some detailed opposition in public comment. Uh, how do you feel about the governor's decision to withdraw those regulations? Would you have stuck with it? The, uh, I don't know that I'm intricately familiar with, uh, with what the governor did or what the legislature did on this, on this particular issue. Uh, let me just say I, I uh, believe that uh, the folks who are transgender, tran transgender in our school, transgender in our school, they deserve equal protection under the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, my hope and expectation is that's what the governor and legislature are trying to do. All right. The same CPC poll, by the way, found that 75% of Delawareans uh, support such laws protecting LGBT students in schools. Um, let's go to a question now from a Delaware State University student. This one focuses on immigration. Uh, this student is a, bio a junior, a biology major from Delaware State. Let's listen. So financial aid is a big part of going to college. However, there are still many states in the U.S. that do not offer financial aid to DACA students. So how do you plan on helping uh, making college more affordable for DACA recipients? So the student's talking about the dreamers, the students of dreamers. Um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Arlette first to respond to that question. Well, you know, I, I will tell you that we are a nation of immigrants. My wife and her family came to this country many years ago, legally and lawfully. They followed the rules. And others who do not, I would question their ability to be in this country and why they're in this country. Specifically, to answer the question directly, why would I want to give an extra benefit to a DACA student when other students that are American citizens don't receive that same benefit? That would be called discrimination, would it not? So to me, uh, are we all, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so if, if you are here in this country, I think we need to know who you are and why you are here. Let's get them documented, right? And then we can move forward accordingly. But to give them an extra benefit at the expense of the American people who do not, I would not support that. Senator Carper? Yeah, I don't know what we're talking about as an extra benefit. We live in a country where there are about 200 million jobs. 200 million people go to work uh, tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow there are 3 million jobs where nobody's going to show up because uh, they don't have the, uh, the interest, they don't have the skills, they don't have the education to do a particular job. Three million jobs. Meanwhile, we've got about 700,000 people here who are born in other countries, brought here by their peasants, uh, parents at early ages, and they've been educated here, they want to serve here, they love this country, it's the only country they've ever known. And we're going to say to you, at a time when we have three million jobs we can't fill, we're going to send you home the place you came from. I think that's economic insanity. That's insanity. And, uh, I, I'm in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, not that gives the people that are here illegally by like amnesty. I'm not interested in doing that. But I want us to find a way that we, the people who are from other countries can come here and work, a, vi, a worker visitor program. I want to make sure that, that, that folks who are maybe here undocumented have the opportunity to, to gain a legal status if they're willing to do all kinds of things. Speak English. Stay out of trouble. Work. You know, be a, be a, be a good citizen. If they're willing to do those things, then they can work their way to a, 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 a legal status. But they need to get behind the folks, get behind the folks that are here legally, trying to become legally, work their way to citizenship. That's the way it should work. All right, here's a question from a University of Delaware student, a junior in public policy and women and gender studies that focuses on the Me Too movement, broadly speaking. Let's listen. Should Congress and the courts hold President Trump to the same standard regarding sexual misconduct and the treatment of women as the Me Too movement has held other politicians, government leaders, and business leaders? All right, Senator Carper, you want to tackle that one first? I, none of us are above the law. And, uh, and I think uh, we, uh, uh, if we commit crimes, you know, we should uh, be, be held responsible. I think one of the great concerns we had, a lot of us had with your nomination of Brett Kavanaugh was... Uh, his views of the president being above the law. 
And that was certainly one of the things that concerned me because he may be in a position, see, we'll see where the Mueller investigation goes, but he may be in a position, he may be the, somebody say the get out of jail card for the, uh, for the president in a 5-4 uh, uh, Supreme Court. Um, I don't think presidents are above the law. I don't think any of us are above the law. I think we need to be held uh, accountable for, uh, for our decisions. I think one of the worst things that uh, folks who, who make a, a, a mistake, and I, I've learned this as a, a new go governor and try to teach this to other governors and, and others who follow me. If you make a mistake, admit it. Acknowledge it. Don't hide it. Admit it. And, uh, and say, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Apologize. Don't make that mistake again. And I've my whole life tried to do that. And uh, my guess is that uh, uh, if we do that, then we'll be better off and our country will be too. Mr. Arlette, should Congress uh, and the courts hold the president accountable to the same standards that the the industries, the various industries that are doing in the Me Too movement? Absolutely. Again, no one, no one is above the law. The issue and problems with Congress is that many of them think they are. We all now know that there is a slush fund funded by the taxpayers of this very country that has gone to pay off victims of sexual assault and abuse from Congress. That's a now known fact. Why is that list not revealed? The American taxpayers owe that. And also, I would like to add that this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. That's this month. I'm in office today because I defended a young girl and her family when she was assaulted and nobody else would. There was an elected official downstate and I went to the aid and I was asked to run for that office because nobody else would hold him accountable. We stepped up when nobody else would. I defend women in this country, and I would also like to ask uh, the center uh, a, a question if I could, and that would be that there, I do know that there was a group of, of, uh, of women that stormed the office, your office in Washington, D.C. this last week, demanding your resignation uh, because of your past history of assault against women. So I'm wondering, if you are not above the law, do you agree with that woman's group? Senator the woman Trump, apparently came to our office. I heard about it. I didn't see her. I was told that she was just really bizarre. And I think she brought a television camera with her. She was looking for some kind of uh, episode. And uh, she was disappointed when she left. I don't feel like I'm above the law. And when people show up that are as, excuse my French, bonkers as this lady was, she was not going to get the time of, of my day. But that doesn't address the question. The question is if, right? What's your question? Again, I'll go back to the, to the question. And that is, one has stated that they're not above the law. Uh, it is, it is, said that. this lady's not the law. This lady was like over the top, sure. out of control. I, I, and, you I, know, when people are like that, do, do we, do we need to honor them as we would the law? Yeah. I don't think so. I, I guess the ultimate question would be is you, you are now on record. It's now public information that you had abused your former wife. And it was, there was a lie for 19 years about that. It was a big cover-up. It was big collusion. That is baloney. That is baloney. Let's, let's set the record straight, okay, my friend? Sure. Let's set the record straight, okay? okay? Every one of us makes mistakes. God knows I've made my share of mistakes. Well, 40 years ago, I made a mistake. I owned it. I didn't hide it. It was public knowledge. My wife at the time, publicly, on television, radio, newspaper, said, this is the kind of man I married. This is the kind of man that raised my children. She died a number of years ago. Her son, my stepson that I raised for five years, he's like my third son. He loves me as much as I love him. I'm his only parent that's left. And his grandmother, who still is alive in Greenwood, Delaware, I'll be with her on her birthday. It's October 23rd. And again, I will bring her flowers, as I do for her birthday, for Valentine's Day, and for Christmas. She thinks I'm her second son. She has a little dimension now. But this is, this is, a, this is the kind of husband I've been with Martha for 32 years. This is the kind of father I was for my stepson, Greg. This is the kind of father I am for Christopher and Jack. Every year, every other year for 40 years, people like you, my friend, have just dredged this up to try to create mischief for me and political mischief for me. And let me just say, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It didn't work, six, it didn't work 30 years ago. It didn't work 20 years ago. It didn't work 10 years ago. And you know what? It's not going to work this time either. Okay, and the I'm reason gonna... why is because voters have actually voted on this. They've considered it, and they say, we're not going there. We're not going there. And they didn't. And I think before this year is over, they won't go there again. All right, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call a halt to that. So I'm going to ask a halt to that topic. We've covered, I think we've covered it adequately. Uh, there are some questions about social media that I'd like to move to at this point. First, I'd like to ask you, do you think social media in this country has played a positive or negative role on the democratic process, both in the United States and in the world? 
Mr. Arlette? I, I think it's played a, a process, I, I think is what it has played. I think, uh, I, I believe that social media has, uh, has gone on to a whole other sphere as far as the First Amendment and people having the opportunity to have a voice. Uh, there's a lot of warriors behind those keyboards. Uh, they're not so much so in person, as we all know. Uh, and I think that the, in the end, I think social media is a good thing. I would call, call it to question the companies that are trying to filter uh, people from having that voice who have their own ideology uh, issues. And I know Congress is addressing that very issue right now. But again, I think in, in general, I think it's a very, very good thing. All right, Senator Carper, question is, positive or negative role by social media in the democratic process? I, largely a good thing. We communicate uh, with as candidates, we communicate as office holders to uh, constituents uh, through social media in many ways. The, uh, where we get in trouble, a couple of ways. One, we get in trouble when the folks that uh, are the Facebooks of, of the world, where they're not doing a very good job policing the, uh, the, the entities that are using Facebook or some other uh, platform to uh, fabricate, to lie, and to distort. And they have to do a better job of making sure that uh, does, does, does not happen. Uh, Thomas Jefferson used to say, if the American people know the truth, they won't make a mistake. And one of the problems and challenges we face today is the American people don't know the truth anymore. And certainly with this president, he has a, a loose association with the truth. And uh, that is not a good thing. And it's not a good way for a leader to provide a leadership by example. Okay, now both of you have mentioned this and one of the students actually wanted to follow up on this topic as well. It's a senior political science major here at the University of Delaware who wants to ask a question about social media companies. Let's listen. Should social media companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook, and others be held accountable for the effects on society and politics of the content of their users? Should they be held accountable, and how should they be held accountable, Mr. Arlett? It's a great question. I, I think, again, you know, I think should they be held accountable for somebody else's actions? I would say probably not. It is a platform. However, I think there is a role and a responsibility when we're talking about terrorists and other, other things. Uh, I think they do have a role that can help help to augment and keep our communities and, and our country safe. So uh, in general, I would say no to that. Uh, but again, I think that there is a, 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 an opportunity to do some things to safeguard the people. Okay, Senator Carter. Please paraphrase that question again uh, for you. Yeah, uh, should the social media companies, the Googles, the Twitters, the Reddits and so on, be held accountable in some way for the effects of, their, uh, of, the, of what their users do in the in the democratic process. Yeah. I think um, one, of the, the, one of the things we do in the Congress, we ought to be doing in this case, we have been doing in this case, is holding oversight hearings in the House and in the Senate. Bring these people, bring the leaders of these companies, uh, platforms before us, and have them publicly explain what they're doing and, and bring witnesses both for and against uh, the positions they're taking. And the other thing uh, in the executive branch, there are executive branch uh, uh, agencies that have some responsibility over, over these entities as well. And they have their own responsibilities for doing oversight and making sure that um, the, what, what these platforms are doing is consistent with the, the better, uh, betterment of our country and, 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 uh, and state. All right. Another student question now on a different topic entirely, uh, talking about the environment. Uh, this is a junior political science major here at the University of Delaware. Should the United States adhere to the Global Climate Change Treaty that it signed? All right, should the United States adhere to the climate change uh, treaty, Mr. Arlette? I, I think that we should not be the, uh, the police agencies of the world when it comes to the environment, especially when we're the biggest bulk of the expense. And so to me, I would answer the question, and I don't know the details, okay, I've not read it specifically, but in generic terms, I would not be supportive of that. Does not mean that we should not be working with others, does not mean, I don't know the details as well, how much we've got in it as far as the financial aspect of that, as compared to other countries around the nation. And, and again, I think that we all have to be good stewards of God's gift. That is this environment. That's not a, a political thing. It's not even a partisan thing. I think it's a principled thing. We all need to be good caretakers of our environment. And I certainly am uh, supportive of that. Okay, I'm still a little confused though. We had a treaty. It was the United States signed a treaty on okay. climate change. Uh, it's, the president has said we're not in it anymore. Are you suggesting yes, we should be or not, no, we well, shouldn't again, be? I don't know the details. Okay. And, and does he have the ability to just at will make the decision to pull out of a treaty, I think that would be up to a judge or a court to make that decision. Or Congress maybe. Okay. Or, or perhaps Congress, but I don't know the details, but I'm speaking what I just shared is in, in general thought, and I'm right. sure perhaps the, the, the president might seem 
to think very similar. Senator Carper, global climate change treaty, should the U.S. adhere to it? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Tom Friedman has something called the uh, uh, Trump Doctrine. He says, it goes something like this. Barack made it, built it, Trump broke it, you fix it. And uh, one thing after the other that Barack Obama was involved in establishing, this president has seen uh, uh, clear to, to, to destroy it. He thinks he makes himself bigger by making others, including Barack Obama and Joe Biden, smaller. We, we, uh, we live in a, in a place where I've never seen the kind of extreme energy that's facing us these days, extreme, extreme weather. Um, thousand year floods every two years. Hurric Category five hurricanes like we've never seen before. Wildfires in Montana, Idaho, Oregon, California, bigger than the state of Delaware. We spent $300 billion last year in responding to extreme weather events, $300 billion. And, what we, and the seas are rising. We live in the lowest lying state in America. The seas are rising and we're sinking. That ain't a good combination. Something, something's happening here and just what it is is pretty clear. And it was we have too much carbon in the air. We're the primary cause of that. We can do something about it. We can do something about it in a way that creates jobs by addressing the need for reducing carbon from mobile sources, our cars, trucks, and vans, and from our uh, stationary sources. We had actually plans laid out, clearly laid out in regulations, and the administration, the uh, industries accepted them, and now they've been repealed, which is a shame. Would you favor imposing new taxes to reduce carbon emissions? Uh, that I, the Republicans have been suggesting for a long time that we do a carbon tax. The ones that are suggesting it don't get to vote. So none of the Republicans are willing to vote for it. So when there's more of a bipartisan, a bipartisan consensus, I think there'd be a whole lot of interest in that. But you know what they're huge interest in right now is making sure that fuel efficiency standards for cars, trucks, and vans continues to ramp up. Near-term flexibility, but it continues to ramp up. So that when 2030 rolls around, we'll have a heck of a lot of electric-powered, battery-powered vehicles and a bunch powered by hydrogen and fuel cells. And that will reduce dramatically the largest source of emissions from our biggest source, and that's our mobile sources. Mr. Arlette. And we can do that and at the same time create jobs. A carbon emissions tax, would you vote for that? Um, not likely. Uh, you know, I think uh, I'm not a big person on taxes, but again, um, d never not saying I'm a, uh, not against it. Uh, you, better, you better convince me real well. I, I think I'll get back down to a point earlier. We already have rules and regulations in place. We need to enforce it. I do know the EPA under Barack Obama, President Obama, there were 56 uh, regulations put forward. And I want people to understand what that number means. 56 in eight years. Under Clinton and Bush, totality, there were five. They were rolling these regulations out like never before. At the same time, the quality um, of our environment decreased. Why? Because they were not focused on the enforcement and the results, just rolling out regulations. The president has put focus back on results, and I think that's what needs to be done. Focus on the results, not just regulations, which hamper the private industry and costs to the American people without confirming any results. Let's focus on results. All right, here's a simple question for both of you. Do you favor the legalization of marijuana? Senator Carper? Yeah, I think, uh there should, we should uh, pass a federal law, I think I co-sponsored one actually, that says it's uh, not a federal crime uh, to, uh, to have or possess uh, um, marijuana. It's not a, uh, not a federal crime. The, uh, I think we ought to use, I'm old governor, recovering governor, and I think the states uh, can uh, be laboratories of democracy here. And uh, we've got states like Colorado, they're experimenting with this. I have a country like Canada, apparently, is they're gonna exper experiment with this. And my view is we should let them, if they wanna, uh, uh, try it out, try out um, uh, recreational marijuana to make that legal. Let them try it, let them do it. And let us, before we do change the whole, our whole country's approach, let us uh, let a couple of states uh, lead the way and we'll learn from, from, from them. Should the federal government play a role in that or is that a state issue? I think for now it's a state issue. Uh, well, there is a role for the federal government. I don't think there should be a federal law that says people could be uh, arrested, convicted for their possessing marijuana. Mr. Arlette, both yeah. of those questions in favor. I, uh, I, uh, I would um, very much like to see that the federal government declassify uh, the class one classification currently for marijuana because it prevents our veterans from going out and getting a natural source of pain relief. 
They have no choice. Our veterans do not have the ability to get medicinal uh, marijuana to be able to make them feel better uh, when, they, when need be because of that federal law. So I would totally support that to ensure that not only that our veterans are able to, to have more options, but also so that more testing can be done to ensure that we know what we got when it comes to medicinal use. I do believe it, it should be a state's rights issue. This is a natural plant. And, and again, I think, uh, I think the government can, is, has a tendency to do too much for much for all. That's not really what the federal government's role is. The power truly lies with the states. So to me, I would be just fine with pushing it over to the states. I'm not saying I would be supportive of it in Delaware or not. That would be a state's issue. I think there are, as, uh, as uh, uh, Tom had stated, that there are some states experimenting with it. I think it's too early to say, but I think ultimately, I think the government should at minimum uh, declassify it so our veterans can get cared for and right. with other options. Point of information, that same Center for Political Communication poll shows that 61% of Delawareans favor the legalization of marijuana. Now a question for both of you on federal government office holders. I'd like to ask both of you whether you favor term limits for federal and, uh, office holders, elected office holders, and for federal judges. Senator Carper? I, I, I mentioned earlier, I think the idea of, of uh, what we do here in Delaware on judges is uh, governors nominate people to serve on the, uh, the uh, judiciary. Uh, for every, when I was governor, for every Democrat uh, vacancy I had, I had to re replace that person with a Democrat. For every Republican vacancy, I had to re replace that person with a, a Republican. Had a judicial nominating commission that received names of people interested in those positions. And they, uh, I considered they would send me a handful of names. I consider them up or down. Submit one name to the executive committee in the, the uh, state senate. And they would vote for them up or down. They voted for, actually, as it turned out, eight years they voted for every one. And uh, they served 12 year terms. And after 12 years, they want to serve again. They can reapply and go through the, through the system again. I think it's a good, good system. And it's one given the kind of um, the situation we face in Washington these days. It's one that, as we think of alternatives, I think we might want to consider this one. Mr. Arlette, term so limits? Is that, is that a yes? So I love <laughs> oh, on, with respect to, uh, to term, term limits, limits for, for, for uh, members, of members of Congress and members of Congress, and Congress and members of House. And when I was in the House of Representatives, I co-sponsored uh, legislation, actually a constitutional amendment uh, with a Republican from, from Florida that says uh, 12 years in the House, 12 years in the Senate, and uh, that should be it. Nobody else really like the idea. And I co-sponsored it for another Congress, and finally it just like went away. Okay. And now I decided, hey, let the voters decide, let them decide, and if they get tired of me or Rob or anybody else, they'll, uh, they'll send us a message. Mr. Arlette, term limit? Uh, absolutely, I, if it's good enough for eight years for the president, two terms, that should be good, good enough for all others. Because when they stay in office for career, career politicians, I believe are, is the biggest problem we have in this nation. They become bought and sold by corporations and donors, and they are no longer focused on the American people. They become focused on one thing, and that's getting reelected and patting their pockets. So I am absolutely supportive of term limits, and I think it's responsibility to ensure that they focus on the American people versus patting their own pockets and getting reelected. All right, we have another question from a student now here at the University of Delaware, a sophomore political science major who wants to ask a sort of big picture question about Washington. Let's listen. In an increasingly politically polarized nation, how would you promote bipartisanship? All right, bipartisanship. How would you promote it at this point? Mr. Arlette, you're first up uh, on it's, this. Uh, it's called uh, what you do speak so loud that what you say I cannot hear. It's all based on what your actions are. We are a proven bipartisan person. I'm not a party guy, ask the Republicans. <laughs> I don't, I don't uh, drink all their Kool-Aids, uh, if you would. And, and I have always put a focus back on the people and the constituents. I think that's what's most important. Again, my opponent over here has stated he's running for re-election for one purpose. That is to obstruct and resist the President of the United States. How is that forming bipartisanship? Out of the gate. We need to get back to the Delaware way. The Delaware way historically means that we as Delawareans focus on serving the, the American people or the Delaware people by working across the aisle. We need a statesman in Washington, D.C. We don't need a partisan politician. We need a statesman that will work across the aisle because of their actions and not because of their words. Senator Carper, bipartisanship? Yeah, it'd be interesting if you had the opportunity to have a, a, a real conversation with my Republican colleagues in the United States Senate about, uh, uh, about working with me. There used to be a guy named Ted Kennedy in the, uh, the Senate there, and there's still a guy named uh, Mike Enzi, Republican from, from, uh, uh, from Wyoming. And uh, Ted Kennedy was most, uh, well-respected 
Democrat, the Republicans love to work with. And I once asked him, why is that? He said, because I believe, you know, I'm not going to change my principles, but I'm willing to compromise on my policy. I took that to, that to advice, and I took it to heart. And that's what I do. Last uh, week, we passed by 99 to 1 vote the Water Resources Development Act, the first infrastructure bill of this Congress. It's a huge bill with huge advantages to Delaware for the Port of Wilmington, for our beaches, for quality drinking water and, and, uh, and uh, wa wastewater. And when we go back in this session, and I did it with a Republican, John Barrasso from Wyoming. And when we go back in the day after we come back after the election, the first of that legislation we're going to take up is the reauthorization of the Coast Guard, which I've helped to write as well with a couple of Republicans and another Democrat. The, uh, one of the things I've loved to do is, and I've done it ever since I was governor, orientation for new governors when people were elected Democrats and Republicans. I used to run that as governor when I was chairman of the National Governors Association. I do the same thing for new senators. Every two years, right after the election, we have orientation for new senators and spouses. I help run that. I've done that for 17, 18 years, and I'll do it again this year. Maybe Rob will be one of the people coming in as a new senator. Who knows? But if, if he is, I'll make sure that he gets a, a good start. I love doing that. And it gets me a chance to get to know people, new people, Democrats and Republicans, and make them feel welcome and at home. All right. I'm a, your vote. I'd love I, to earn your vote, Tom. Uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> Count me. <laughs> I'm afraid that concludes our time available for Q&A during this uh, debate. And I do want to give both of you the opportunity to offer some voters, the voters uh, some concluding thoughts of yours. So uh, we'll start, and again, the order of this, these statements were chosen by the candidates in the coin toss. We'll start with Senator Tom Carper for a closing statement limited to two minutes, please. Yeah. I, I want to thank the University of Delaware for hosting us tonight and for everybody for showing up. And uh, this is a um, tough issue. This is a tough issue that we face this year. It's a huge issue that we face this issue. And who's going to lead our country? Uh, my opponent uh, seems to support Donald Trump's plans to sabotage, sabotage, further sabotage our healthcare system, to add to the debt largely through tax cuts that benefit the wealthier people, to ignore the existence of climate change despite very clear evidence that it's happening and we're contributing to it. My vision for America is a far different one. I'm running for, uh, for re-election to extend quality affordable health care to all Americans and to do so by improving the Affordable Care Act, not repealing it, and by protecting 400,000 Delawareans who have pre-existing condition. I'm running for election to protect uh, Robert Mueller's investigation and to restore checks and balances that will help make this nation great over the last 230 years. I'm running for election to ensure that workers get a raise, not just shareholders, workers get a raise, and that we don't somehow derail the longest running economic expansion in the history of the country, uh, now nine years, nine years long, with foolish economic policies and trade wars that uh, sometimes make no sense. I'm running for re-election to ensure that Amer America's moral obligation to the least of these in our society remains strong and that we meet that moral obligation in fiscally sustainable ways. I'm running for re-election to make sure that, that, we take, uh, that we combat and take on climate change and global warming and that we, we do so in ways that, that create jobs. I'm, making, uh, I'm going to make sure that we choose windmills over oil wells and create jobs at the same time. I love this little state. I love to serve the people of this little state. And more than ever, I think we need leaders in Washington who can work with people on both sides, Democrat and Republican. I just gave you some examples of do that, but who have a shared vision of economic opportunity and I guess equal justice for everybody. And I hope other people share that vision. And if you do, I hope you'll see fit to support me on November the 6th. And uh, if they do, uh, let's seize the day. Carpe diem, thank you. Mr. Arlett, your closing statement, also limited to two minutes, please. Yeah, I want to thank you, Ralph. I want to thank the University of Delaware and the audience, uh, specifically also my wife and my elder son, who's here today with us. Uh, our younger son, of course, is at the Naval Academy, and, uh, and we uh, wish he was here, but he's not able to be here. We have a choice. We have a choice in 20 days. We have a choice of looking to the past, partisanship, politics, career politician, what's wrong with Washington, D.C.? I think we need to focus on the future. And I agree with my opponent when he said 18 years ago that it was time for generational change. I am stepping up to be that next generation in Delaware to lead the families of this great state and ultimately the, of this great nation. We must focus on the people and not this partisan bickering that's going on that we are all so fed up with. My vision is of one of greatness. My vision is to ensure that we put the first state first 
again. Putting a focus on jobs. We need real opportunities in this state yet again. We need a real affordable health care and not what it exists today. We need a great education for our kids and for our families. So when the opportunities come back, these jobs, they have new ways. I want to educate our kids and then keep them here. That's my goal as a father and as a husband and, 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 and somebody who just cares about our families. We have got to put a focus there. So as we move forward in just 20 days, I am asking you, to get to RobArlet.com, learn more about the vision, learn more about the excitement everywhere we go is changing in this state. People are ready for change in this great state of Delaware. I implore you to do so, get involved, and I look forward to earn your vote come November the 6th. God bless you and thank you. Councilman Rob Arlett, thank you very much. Senator Tom Carper, thank you very much both for participating in Delaware Debates 2018. On behalf of Delaware Public Media and the University of Delaware Center for Political Communication, I'm Ralph Begleiter thanking you for joining us on Delaware Debates 2018 and encouraging you to cast your vote on Tuesday, November 6th.